Afghanistan has been ruled by the Taliban since 1996. Since then, the movement has been trying to create what it sees as the world's purest Islamic state. Earlier this month, the Taliban destroyed two giant Buddha statues and other objects at an ancient site of Bamiyan. And they've been linked with Arab radicals such as Osama bin Laden. Joining me now from Washington, Syed Ramatullah Hashimi. He is a representative of Afghanistan Foreign Ministry and a special assistant to the spiritual leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar. Here in New York with me, Barnett Rubin. He is the director of studies at the Center on International Cooperation at New York University. He's also the author of several books on Afghanistan, and I am pleased to have both of them here, uh, both in Washington and New York. And in the interest of, of time, we will uh, refer to each other uh, in, in the shortest abbreviation possible. Mr. Hashimi, let me start with you. Tell me why you're in New York, in America, and, and what it is you hope to uh, accomplish. Well, uh, I was here to deliver a letter through the State Department to the new administ uh, administration in uh, Washington, hoping that the policies of the United States towards the region, in particular to our country, will at least be rethought. So. In the meantime, I was giving some talks uh, in some schools uh, here, which I did. Uh, this characterized the United States' relationship to your government? Well, there is, uh, after the Soviet withdrawal, the United States just uh, ignored Afghanistan and all those problems that uh, were there. So uh, many of those problems has been resolved now, like the reunification of that country and uh, disarming the people, uh, the opium eradication and is uh, having one administration. Now there is one problem that is the terrorism existence of bin Laden in Afghanistan. And we have been telling people that <coughs> if anybody can give us some kind of evidence, we will resolve this problem. Uh, but so far we have uh, not been given any kind of evidence that shows that bin Laden is actually a terrorist. Is it your position that bin Laden does not, uh, is not a terrorist? and? And are your government's position that he is in fact not a terrorist and that he is in fact not taken credit for terrorist acts and that he does not uh, uh, both in his rhetoric suggest terrorist acts against the United States? Well, he says that he has done nothing and we don't know anything. If anybody claims that he is a terrorist should prove it. Well, but his rhetoric suggests that he is, does it not? He, no, we have, we have not, not seen anything that, so, that shows that he is a terrorist. We have said that he is not even allowed to be politically active against any country. Let and me come back to him because there are a lot of other things, as you know, because we have uh, trials going on in the United States in which people are alleging uh, connections and that kind of thing. I'll come back to that. But you are meeting with people at the State Department and talking about your government's position uh, on bin Laden as well as other issues? Exactly. We have said that we have given three proposals to the United States so far. Uh, one of that was that we will try him in Afghanistan, provided that we are given evidence. Uh, that was rejected. Uh, we gave a second proposal in which we asked the United States that if they think he's a threat to the U.S. security, they have to send international monitoring group to watch him for the rest of his life so that he has nothing and meets nobody. That was also rejected. And we gave a third proposal in which we asked three countries, uh, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and a third Islamic country selected by the United States to decide his future so that we have some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, justifications to our people uh, so that they, this man is a not a good guy and he should be expelled or extradited or whatever. But we have not been assisted in this sector. And for the fourth time, I was here again asking the U.S. government to at least open the doors of negotiations on bin Laden issue. All right, we'll come back to bin Laden. Just one quick question before I go to Mr. Rubin and other things. Uh, do you... Uh, acknowledge the fact that Mr. Bin Laden pays um, your government for his protection in Afghanistan? That's absolutely wrong. He has not that much to pay us. So he stays there uh, under the protection of the Taliban because what? He was in Afghanistan 17 years before we existed. Such people were instigated to go to Afghanistan and fight the Soviet Union. And such people were called the heroes of independence, not by us. Such people were called the heroes of independence by the President of the United States, by Mr. Ronald Reagan. And all of a sudden, they have changed to terrorists. Okay, if he is a terrorist, how are you going to justify trying to kill a man without even giving him a fair trial? The United States tried to kill him without even telling us that he is a terrorist. 
all these things have aggravated the situation. He was nobody and he has been made a hero now. He has been made so famous. 6,000 children were named after him in Pakistan only. And so many restaurants, cars, shoes, jackets, all these things. So this is not our creation. All right, we still have not yet come to the issue of the Buddhist statues, and I'll do that after giving uh, Mr. Rubin a chance to talk about the things that we have been uh, speaking about so far. Tell me what, how you see this and what the United States position is likely to be and, and whether uh, Hashimi will meet any success in, with his audience at the State Department. Well, I think this discussion exemplifies the problem with U.S. policy toward Afghanistan, which is that for several years we have not really had a policy toward Afghanistan. We have had a policy toward Osama bin Laden because Osama bin Laden is a person and a symbol of a phenomenon that the United States thinks is a direct threat to it because of the bombings in Africa, because of other activities of which he is accused. I don't have access to that secret information that shows that he is a terrorist. There's a trial going on here. But I think the important point is what is the context in which this is taking place. And the context is a country that the major world powers have spent billions and billions of dollars to destroy for over 20 years. A country which was one of the poorest countries in the world at that time and which has lost much of what they had both in buildings, roads, government structures, and most important, people and educated people so that someone like Mr. Hashimi, who is a 24-year-old former refugee, is one of the most polished and educated people that the current authorities in Afghanistan have to send to the outside world. Because all the other people who were educated and were specialists were killed, jailed, or expelled, and are living as refugees in various places. Now, that is a context in which any assistance is welcome. It's a context, it's an extreme context in which extremist ideologies may seem to some people much more rational because they are dealing with a very extreme situation. And if someone comes to them and fights on, on their side and is willing to assist them, and they are not getting what they see as significant assistance from other people, the people who helped them destroy the country as part of their civil war, then they will welcome that person. That is what is now happening. The Taliban's original agenda was not to support international terrorism. Now I believe the Taliban as an organization is allied with people who are guilty of international terrorism. People who, as Mr. Hashimi correctly says, were originally recruited to come by the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan to fight in that war, were given that training and supported to do that. Now they have turned against us, we have turned against them, but what we are, and we are having a dialogue of the deaf about this subject in which I'm not supporting the Taliban's position, but we are not addressing the major problem, which is the destruction of that country, the death of millions of its people, the huge drought, which is making hundreds of thousands of people into displaced people. And if we did address those, that would change the terms of the discussion. Right, I'll come back. I'm, I'm going to have to come back to Osama bin Laden in just a moment. But, but what, are the, the, what we should be addressing is what, this gov what the American government's uh, policy is with respect to Afghanistan and whether it can do a uh, send aid because of the drought and and the destruction I assume you're talking about is what I assume you're talking about the destruction of the Buddhist the Buddhist no, statute no, I'm, or you're talking uh, about no, the destruction of something else I'm talking about the destruction of virtually everything that was of value in Afghanistan over the past 20 years are you talking about destruction by the war by all the, the war with the Russians and the war in, and the civil war and what are you talking about that's right the war with the Soviets the civil war among the various groups, the criminal activities culminating in this criminal destruction of world heritage that just took place. But if you drive around Afghanistan, all the roads are destroyed to the point that there are small children standing by the roads who should be in school, picking up dirt with their bare hands and throwing it on the huge potholes which are bigger than the paved parts in the hope that a passing trucker, who is probably a smuggler of some kind because no one else has the money to uh, drive trucks, will give them a little money, maybe the equivalent of one cent or five cents, in return for throwing this dirt on the road. And mostly they don't get that. So that, if you go to the capital Kabul, you will see that, I don't know, 50 percent, 60 percent of the buildings are in complete ruins. They're whole neighborhoods that are completely desolated by rockets and missiles that we paid for with our tax dollars and that our uh, uh, allies uh, also paid for and that the Soviets also sent there and that today those missiles are still being sent there to the Taliban and the other side by the neighboring countries and which is turning not only Afghanistan but the entire region around it 
including Pakistan and Central Asia, into a very dangerous area where conflict is spreading and where nuclear weapons are, are located in a number of in, countries. In Pakistan. In Pakistan, and there are also some in Kazakhstan. Characterize well. the Taliban for me. Um, the Taliban are a transnational organization which arose originally in Afghanistan. They represent the traditional rural mullahs of southern Afghanistan um, who are linked very closely to some of their colleagues in Pakistan itself uh, through a number of madrasas, Islamic academies, where they study. This is a social group that every government in Afghanistan for the last 100 years tried to marginalize and put out of power. But as a result of this war, most of the other elites that had come to power, the secular educated people, the Soviet educated Western people, have been eliminated. Furthermore, uh, these people who arose in response to the situation of chaos and violence in southern Afghanistan have then been built up and used and manipulated by the Pakistan intelligence services and the Pakistan government in order to take over Afghanistan and put in place a government which will be sympathetic to Pakistan and which serves Pakistan's interests. They have Im imposed on Afghanistan um, a kind of vision which is typical of their social origin, that is these rural uh, Islamic leaders, but in turn radicalized by this experience of war, and which is very different from and opposed to the views of what kind of government there should be among the urban population, the educated population, and the other ethnic groups in the country. A couple of quick questions about other personalities. One, uh, Mr. Massoud, what do you make of him? Um, again, Massoud is a great guerrilla commander who resisted the Soviets. What he has turned into, however, is essentially a kind of ethnic leader. What he represents is it now is he is, he is organizing resistance among Persian-speaking people in North Afghanistan. This has to do with the way Afghanistan is structured as a state. When Mr. Hashmi says they have imposed a single administration on Afghanistan or re-established it, um, that is correct to some extent. However, they impose this by force, and this administration represents the views of a very narrow segment of the population. But it's also true that before they did this, there was no administration in most of Afghanistan, and there was a kind of chaos and anarchy. Massoud constructed a structure in one part of the country. Now, what many Afghans would like is for Afghanistan to be constructed out of those different communities. Massoud to be a part of that as representative of his own region and community. But he is too caught up in this geopolitical game, and he is being supported by Iran, Russia, the Central Asian states, who are trying to resist Pakistan, which is using the Taliban, to carry out its own policy in Afghanistan. Massoud knows, in fact, that he is not an alternative to the Taliban. Um, because he, he doesn't have a big enough ethnic base, and he's never going to have a big enough support base. Um, but he is hoping that there will be a split in the Taliban, or that something will happen that will enable him to break out of the spot that he is in right now. But now, I was before I, before I go back to Mr. Uh, Hashimi. Do you have any doubt that Osama bin Laden is a terrorist? No, you don't. No, it's clear to you. Yes. Why isn't it clear to Mr. Hashimi? Well, he should speak for himself, but although I could... Respond. You could what? Okay, go ahead. I mean, let's come back to Osama bin Laden, then we'll come to, the, to Massoud and other issues that we spoke to. Go ahead. And who supports whom? You're asking me? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, I was surprised how much Mr. Robin knows about the region, and I really appreciate some of his views. But there are things that he said that I will not principally agree upon. He said that uh, the Taliban were established by the ISI of Pakistan or the intelligence of Pakistan, which I don't think is right. Our good relations with Pakistan does not mean that we are their puppets. We want good relations with everybody, uh, with, particularly with, with our neighbors, and Pakistan is very crucial in them. So we have said that our good relations with somebody does not mean that we are their puppets. And if we were going to be somebody's puppets, then we would be American puppets than, uh, than becoming Pakistan's puppets. So all, I've, all I have to say is that who, we don't say we are perfect. We say that who could do better than we did? We reunified that country that was almost fragmented formally. We eradicated the opium cultivation. Afghanistan was producing 75% of all world's drugs. So we finished it in one year. We disarmed people. The United Nations couldn't do it. In 1992, the United Nations passed an appeal asking for three billion dollars to repurchase those arms and certainly it was impracticable they couldn't do it and we did it in no in, in no time and very easily and spending not even a penny on that so 
95% of the people are disarmed now. So all you can see is that who could do better than we did? In five years, we don't say we are perfect. There are still rooms for improvement, but we have not been assisted so far. All we have seen is criticism, isolation, ostracism, and cruise missiles. Where are the rooms for improvement? Let's do consider that for a second. All we have said that please, if, if you have concerns, don't send us cruise missiles. Please talk to us. We have not been recognized so far. We have not been assisted so far. We have been under sanction. So what do you expect from a country from which you don't consider as a government, which is just hit with cruise missiles? And we are still very patient. The we cruise not missiles were not directed at the Taliban. The cruise missiles were directed at bin Laden. Whatever. He did, did they kill bin Laden? And what is the justification for killing a man without even giving him a fair trial? Did they kill him or did they kill him? Uh, oh, I think they're, they're very prepared to give him a fair trial if he would like to pre present himself for <laughs> well, trial. We, we were not asked that he was needed. And how, what, how do we know but, that but, he... But, may, but, may, I, may I interject myself yeah, here? Please. I think this illustrates the problem. You see, Mr. Hashmi lives in Afghanistan. His primary concern is not protecting... U, uh, is not protecting U.S. embassies and U.S. destroyers. Now, of course, I don't agree with him, and I don't agree with the policies of the Taliban. But people in Afghanistan are concerned about the problems of Afghanistan. You are pressing him to be concerned about the problem of the United States, which is that bin Laden poses a threat to us. Now, if we want to have relations with people in Afghanistan, we have to recognize their problems, which actually are a lot bigger than ours. And we have much more capacity to help them with their problems. And they have to help us with ours. Okay. Let's, let's, let me take that point. It's a very good point. Uh, remember, though, when I asked him wh why he was in the United States, he said to talk with, he make some speeches at universities and also talk to people in the State Department about a series of issues of concern to them, including bin Laden. I mean, that was clear from hmm. my first question. And so, therefore, bin Laden becomes part of the, the conversation. And I assume uh, he's asking for evidence, and the United States is prepared to tell you why they think he is, in fact, a terrorist. Moving beyond that, though, uh, what is it you want the government to do uh, other than not to send over cruise missiles or whatever else those issues that you laid? What is it, what would have been an appropriate response for you from the United States about Taliban problems? Well, we, we, would, we would first like the United States not to recognize a rebel group in Afghanistan first. Not to support Masood or what? Exactly. We, right. we, have, we have not been recognized so far. The United Nations seat is given to them and we are under sanctions. So we have said that they have to engage with us. They have to consider us as a government and then talk to us about their concerns. We are humans. We will understand the problems and we cannot be dictated. We cannot bargain on our independence. We have said, okay, if anybody is found guilty of killing civilians, we will punish him, and in our constitution, anybody found guilty of killing civilians will face capital punishment. So could you please help us and give us some sort of assistance, some sort of evidence that could lead to bin Laden's involvement okay. in those attacks? Mr. Rubin may think this is silly, but let me just bear with me one second. Uh, if there was evidence that Mr. bin Laden had something to do with the killing of someone because he, through a, se a series of chain of command, influence terrorism to kill children, you would put him on trial for life. Is that right? We did put him on trial for 45 days. We asked the United States, Kenya, and Tanzania to give us some sort of evidence. Nobody did give us. And now we have come to a decision that maybe the United States is looking for a boogeyman always. Because if they really have concerns from the from bin Laden, they, they have to talk to us. They have, we, don't, we have a full-time job reconstructing our country. We don't want foreign problems for us. But we have not been talked to. All is that we have seen is, is we are being bullied. Well, I, I don't think the Taliban uh, are serious about this question of whether they have evidence uh, against bin Laden or not. He is, he is their ally and supporter, though it is true he, he did not come to Afghanistan to stay with the Taliban, and the Taliban did not bring him to Afghanistan. Um, at the same time... He went looking for a safe haven. Yeah, and when he, was, when he went back to Afghanistan from Sudan in 1996, he did not go to an area which was controlled by the Taliban initially. He went to an area that was controlled by people who were now allied with Massoud, namely the people who were in Jalalabad, and later he, was, he became linked to the Taliban. But I think the point is the Taliban 
have been imposed. Uh, I didn't say that the Pakistani ISI created the Taliban. They did not. But the Pakistani government made the Taliban into a military power. They recruited thousands of Pakistani students to fight along with them. They have given them military advisors. They give them full political support. And several Western intelligence agencies have also told me that they believe there have been Pakistani regular troops fighting with the Taliban in key areas. The point is not to rule the Taliban out of Afghanistan. They're a part of Afghanistan, like Massoud is part of Afghanistan, and like the vast majority of the Afghan people who are neither Taliban nor supporters of Massoud. But the point is that Pakistan, which is the real source of the problem in a way, should not be trying to impose a government of its liking on Afghanistan. That prevents the dialogue that is necessary within Afghanistan among the various parts of the Afghan people. It is also true that Iran, Russia, and other states are, I would say, primarily reacting to Pakistan's policy in Afghanistan by supporting the other side. And, and the dynamic of the relationship between the United States and Pakistan has considerably changed from what it was, say, five or six years ago. Yes, and I hope that the Taliban and also their political advisors in Pakistan understand that. They may think that because the Republicans are back in power, they can restore the friendly relations that they had in the 1980s when they were fighting communism together. But that definitely is not the case, because this administration is going to take a tougher line on terrorism, I believe, than did the Clinton administration. And, and what do you think that might mean? How well, would that I think manifest it's, itself, that toughness? Well, I, I think it means that we are much less likely to consider various policies that I think would be much more helpful, which is to say seriously engaging not just with the Taliban, but with other Afghan forces as well, but also with the Taliban, without recognizing them as a government, over the issues of the drought, of the need for reconstruction, uh, of the need for them to have friendly relations with all the countries around there, and to work with other donor countries to put some serious money on the table, not to give it unconditionally, when very important conditions haven't been met, both about terrorism and also about the equality of women, but to show that there is a serious willingness to address the real problems of Afghanistan. Uh, ra I, I think we should criticize and we should make demands about these things, but we shouldn't only do that. We should recognize there are vast human problems that are partly of our making, and we have a responsibility and also an interest to address them. Our making because we were a player in the Civil War, because we came to the on the side of the, uh, the, the of the forces fighting the Russians? That was the right thing to do. That's what I thought. But so the way well, why is the problem our making? Then because, because we supported the rebels? There were different ways of doing of that, and there were different rebel groups. We subcontracted our policy to Pakistan. Uh, we did not pay any attention to what a future government of Afghanistan might be like because we thought the Soviet Union would never withdraw. So we supported the most extreme groups. We also created this fragmentation that Mr. Hashmi spoke about by giving these weapons not just to seven different parties but to anyone who came and asked for weapons and said they were fighting the Soviet Union. So it became so you had a huge spread of criminality, of smuggling, of killing, of, of theft. So we made it almost impossible. Uh, and when people from the old royal regime in Afghanistan tried to form a common political front, Pakistan stopped them from doing that because of their political differences with the old royal government. And we supported Pakistan in doing that. So while we were right to support the resistance, the way we did that contributed to the policy, to the problems that Afghanistan has today. And then, after the Soviet Union withdrew and collapsed, we walked away from it. And we, we gave some humanitarian aid, but the quantity was pitiful compared to the huge amounts of money we had spent on the war. And it continues to be. Mr. Hashimi, do you think, explain to us and to this audience why it was necessary to change the policy of the Taliban and destroy the Buddhist statutes? Well, we have said that the problems in Afghanistan are not our creations, and we have been saying this again and again. And if we were to destroy those statues, why didn't we destroy them three years ago? So the problem is so funny for us. This is, this is not that serious problem in Afghanistan as it is for you. Your government is killing people in Afghanistan, killing innocent children. You don't see them by the, starve, by the economic sanctions. 700 children died of malnutrition a month ago. So it is, it is so funny for us that who, if, if a country doesn't, if a country is destroying our future with economic sanctions, so how do they worry about our heritage? But, 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 Surely you're good. So, look, first, Barney. the sanctions against Afghanistan, some of which I don't support, 
are not economic sanctions. There is no trade sanction against Afghanistan. There's a sanction against the airline, which I think is mistaken. There's a sanction against arms supplies to the Taliban, which I think is a good thing, except that it's not being enforced or even monitored in any serious way. Those children did not die because of those sanctions. Well, well those... if we... Sorry to intervene. If we can't fly outside and buy medicine, who suffers? If we can't go and sign contracts, we had a contract with Kazakhstan asking for 95,000 metric tons of wheat and we shipped some of that and because of the sanctions it stopped. We had a contract with Bangladesh that we imported rice from them and because of that we can't do it anymore. So who suffers? Even if you, you can't say it is Taliban specific, it, it is ridiculous. It, because if, if we can't go outside and ask people to invest in Afghanistan, of course the people suffer. Well, I don't know about those contracts. The other sanctions in Afghanistan which have had the biggest effect are the Taliban sanctions against the areas of the country that are controlled by the opposition. Um, but, and I should just add that talking about killing people in Afghanistan, recently Taliban troops who retook an area of central Afghanistan massacred several hundred civilians. And the opposing side in other cases massacred several thousand Taliban prisoners. Uh, so there's lots of killing going on. We have said that war is not a festival, and we are against war. We are making order out of that war zone, and we have done it to 95% of the country. The problem in Afghanistan is neither political nor ethnic. It, we don't say that it is ethnic, neither the opposition says this. You, you may think it's political, it is not. The, the problem in Afghanistan is the existence of arms. And we have said that anybody who has arms, we are against them. They have to give us their arms, or, or we will disarm them by force. And we have done it. There were many alliances, you know, Mr. Robin. In Kabul, there were many alliances. Then there were many governments. And then because of existence of arms with everybody, then they would fight again and destroy the whole country. So we have said that we have no pro problem with anybody being in the government, provided that they are disarmed. We cannot accept an armed opposition within our country. Now, if I could say something about that. That is, I would say, a partial truth. And the part of it that I agree with is very important, and it's hard for people in this country to understand, which is the problem in Afghanistan is not, has not been just who's going to be in control of the government. The problem in Afghanistan is that there was not any government. That is, the state collapsed and all kinds of people had arms. So if, you're, if someone was murdered, the only thing you could do was get some weapons yourself and try to kill the people who murdered the people in your family. Now, the Taliban have tried to address that problem in their way. If they had done just what Mr. Hashmi said, disarmed people, created order, and then, under those conditions, allowed the people of Afghanistan to choose their type of government, that would have been positive. Unfortunately, what they have done is they have disarmed people and imposed their own group as the ruling elite. Mullah Omar was elected by 1,200 Islamic scholars whom he invited to Kandahar himself. They consult only those people, a very narrow group of it's the country, and not, they, and not the Afghan people as a whole. Excuse me. Uh, you're right on this, but have you, in a state of war, in a state of 22 years of continuous war, where you have millions of, of, of landmines in your country, where you have a bad starvation because of the drought, where you have all these problems, where there's still foreign interference, where there is still some sort of war going on, how can you talk about election? Isn't it ridiculous? No, I don't mean elections. Uh, you, uh, this is a little too detailed. You can have shuras. There are various plans for doing it. I agree elections are not possible in a country with no administration. If I may say so, I, I, on the other, I, I think this illustrates that on the one hand, it is possible to have a serious discussion with some people in the Taliban. It is also true that there are other people in the Taliban and that behind them, the fact that they know they have the 100 percent backing of Pakistan means that despite these discussions we can have, nothing is really going to move. So I would say... No, but but I mean, does you include Mullah Omar in that characterization? I don't know Mullah Omar, and I don't want to say anything personal about Mullah Omar. Uh, my impression of Mullah Omar is that uh, he has recently sided with the more extreme elements of the Taliban, but I am not authority an authority on Mullah Omar and his personal views. But I think what is most relevant is that those most extreme elements within the Taliban who are dominating them, and there have been a number of reports about that recently, um, understand that they have the full military, political, and financial backing of Pakistan, and therefore they don't have an incentive to take this kind of discussion Excuse that we are me. having and carry it to a Mr. conclusion. Mr. Robin, the problems in Afghanistan is not because of lack of arms. The problems in Afghanistan is because of abundance of arms. We don't need arms. We don't, don't say that Pakistan is giving us arms. They have a big problem with India. So 
For them, it's impossible to support us with arms. Our good relations with Pakistan does not mean that they are that they support us with military supports or whatever. So all these things, and you said that there there are people who are accusing us that there are maybe Pakistani regulars in our uh, in our side. Have do you have any proof? Have anybody seen any Pakistani regulars so far in our front line? You will never find anything. All right. Let me let me. You want to respond to that because I want to move on to. to Go ahead. Move on. Do I understand you to say that you destroyed the Buddhist statutes because uh, you, because of some external reason that you were offended by, or did you change your mind? Did Mullah Omar change his mind, seemingly having viewed the protection of the Buddhist statutes at some point earlier, several years ago, and then changed his mind? Did he change his mind because of some external force or not? Uh, I was here in Los Angeles when this was going on. I called him and he said this is not his decision. This is the decision of the Council of Scholars. And the Council of Scholars had decided it when they were frustrated by a group of foreigners who wanted to repair these statues or, or something like that. They said, please help the children who are starving, of, who are dying of, of malnutrition. We don't need the statues at this time. The statues is not a serious problem for them. For them, their children is much more important than the Okay, statues. but let me stop you so right there, because it's my understanding that not only a lot of cultural figures in the Western world, for the lack of a better definition, also the Secretary General of the United Nations all appealed to you not to do that. My guess is that you could have gotten some money from foreign elements for starving children if that was the issue in order to protect the statute or remove the statutes or something like that other than destroying them. When we talk, it when seemed I to me that it just, they became, the statutes became a tool when in I a talk, geopolitical struggle and had nothing to do with starving children. And when I talked to the Council of Scholars, he said that why are they worrying about her heritage when they're destroying our future? So it is ridiculous but for yeah, them you because keep tying it, you keep tying it to some sense. Why are they worried about a heritage when they're... When, when so it is funny for them because they are they're simply frustrated with all those things that they have seen. They say that if you don't care about our children and we are destroying their future with economic sanctions, why do you, why do you want to repair the statues? And they well, said that any statue in our... And we have not said that all the statues will be destroyed. Okay, These but, statues all right. and, well, let, me, let me just hit one more. I know you want to well, jump in. One, one second. Give me one second to go and then you. But uh, it seems to me you are saying that if in your definition or the Council of Scholars definition you were not, quote, injuring or destroying children, you would not have destroyed the statues. Well, you don't let me to explain to you. What I say that if these, har these statues were harmful, then in our religion we will not allow them. And I ask them, why is it harmful? Well, they say that if the money is going to the statues and not to our starving children, they are harmful. Well, obviously, this is not a rational explanation. Whatever. But I think it is, it reveals something that's important. And that's what I, what I was uh, want to come back to, which is that of course, there's an Islamic principle against graven images. But in Muslim countries all over the world, they preserve their cultural heritage nonetheless. Therefore, we shouldn't understand Taliban just as some kind of extremist religious ideology. It is a reaction to this very extreme situation. Now, it's totally irrational and criminal, in my view, to destroy statues because people are letting children die. And it's also true that the Taliban could have done a lot for those starving children, such as moving those families into the garrison in Herat, instead of leaving them out uh, in the open where they died. But it's also true that the United Nations has issued an appeal, humanitarian appeal, for $254 million for Afghanistan this year. And so far, the nations of the world have subscribed to 8% of yeah. that appeal. 8%. Please, please 8%. Makes... So yeah. it's understandable that people in Afghanistan are very angry about this. It's not rational to destroy the world's cultural heritage out of your anger. Please let me explain it completely. What I say that are the lives of two children less important than these statues? How can you justify starving people when, when, you, when Afghanistan was your playground, you fought their war, and all of the problems in Afghanistan are the reflections of the world's policies, not our creation. So if you don't like the image in the mirror, please don't break the mirror. Break your face. So in Afghanistan, we have said it again and again, that the problems are not our creations. So how can you, for you, I will give you an example. If you ask a pilot to go and blow a place, he will do it. But if you ask the same pilot to go and slaughter those people, he will not. 
you don't see that what you're doing. You are starving children and they are dying every day. All you see is the two statues, which is not a serious problem for us. For us, our children are much important than this. And oh. there are many things that you just pollute. What about the water in the world? You're polluting the water in the world, and that, that causes droughts in our country. You're polluting the air. What about that? You're destroying those old forests thousands of years. What about that? Why aren't they getting so much media as these two statues? Look, Whether or not they're right. It's not only foreigners who care about these statues. I know many Afghan people who are absolutely heartbroken, and among them are people who were defending the Taliban, who are stopped defending the Taliban now because they thought the Taliban would restore some kind of national unity, and now they feel the Taliban are acting against the national heritage of Afghanistan. At the same time, what he says is true, and I find it very strange myself, having worked on this country for so many years, that uh, with millions of people being killed, uh, starvation, destruction of the city, finally the media attention comes when these very valuable, priceless cultural artifacts are destroyed by these extremists who are reacting to that extreme situation. Uh, and he, uh, it's wrong to say that all the problems of Afghanistan are the result of the actions of non-Afghans. They're the result of collaboration between Afghans and non-Afghans. And both the Afghans and the others are responsible. And the Taliban, claiming to be the government of the country, cannot avoid their responsibility for the welfare of the people, even though their resources are few. And they owe it to those people to try to meet the international community's concerns so that they can help those people more. And the fact that they destroyed those statues will, unfortunately, make it even more difficult to help those people. So you see, we are now caught in a kind of escalation of, uh, 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 of, those, of the two sides. And somehow we have to find a way uh, to rebuild the country uh, and um, help those people that he is talking and we, about. Uh, and we, s we waited for two weeks. Mullah Omar delayed these orders of scholars for two weeks in order to get some sort of counter edicts from other Islamic countries to, uh, to, to resolve this problem. And nobody came there. Well, the, there were counter edicts from and other they, Islamic when, countries. When they came and there, there's no excuse for those actions. Uh, I, you, know, you know, there is some explanation of it because Taliban did not come from Mars. They came out of this terrible, extreme situation. But still, uh, there's, no way, there's no way to defend it. I think it is true, however, that there is an image in this country that they are just religious extremists without understanding the, in, the really terrible context in which they are acting, and in my opinion, uh, also which they are making worse. But they are doing that in the conviction that they are making it better. Uh, I have to leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shimi. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure Thank to have you. you here. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We have a conversation with Sebastian Unger, who went to Afghanistan and talked to Mr. Massoud, who we have referred to earlier in this part of the program.